Well, good morning and welcome back to the Gospel of John Bible class. Look at this, chapter 11. We're going to cut off another 10 verses today. Let's start with a prayer. Father above, we're so grateful that you have revealed your holy word to us. And we ask that today that you uh, unpack it for us, open it up, and declare and show to us more clearly your son Jesus, who he is and what he has done for us, for our life and our faith and our unity with you and your spirit. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Okay. You recall where we were in this story so far, perhaps, and if not, that's okay. Look, Jesus has this dear friend named Lazarus who has died. And of course, we know that he even waited when he heard that his friend was sick. And last week, go watch it, we talked all about the significance of that and what he was doing and how he was using these things um, to, to glorify God. And so we're going to now look at the next part after the whole discussion of, oh, well, if we're going to go close to Jerusalem, we're probably going to die. The authorities are there. They want to kill us. So let's go. Let's do it. Say the disciples, let's go with Jesus and die with him. That's where this ends. You know it. But we're only in chapter 11. So let's check, take a look. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb Four days. Now, this is very important. Four days. Why? Why four days? Why does John find it important to tell us that Lazarus has been buried for four days? I'll draw it right here. Rabbis. The rabbis of that day had taught that the spirit and soul, soul hovers over the body. I don't know how to draw. I'm just going to draw a ghost, okay? And don't laugh at my ghost. It's, it's a gentle ghost. He's a nice ghost. There he is. So they taught that the soul hovered over the body for three days after death. And then the soul departs when decomposition sets in, when the body starts to decay. The fourth day was body breakdown day, which means obviously the soul must not be around anymore because the soul is, of course, what holds the body together. It's what makes it one thing. And so this was their, this was their understanding of, of how reality works. And actually, you, can, you have to admit, there's something to that uh, understanding of reality, whether or not the soul is actually there. This is not the point. The point um, is not whether or not that's true, that is to say the soul ha hovers over the body, but that is what they believed. And that's going to be important in why John reveals this detail. Now, as an aside, I'm going to take my chance to use this. It's interesting to notice how this rabbinic teaching and belief gives significance to Jesus's own resurrection, not on the fourth day, but on the third day, and particularly the scriptural promise. You remember that, that Bible verse um, it's quoted in the New Testament of him, Psalm 1610, where God promises that he would not let his Holy One see decay. You remember that verse? The Holy One will not see corruption. All, um, uh, no decay, no corruption for that Holy One. And, and by the way, the apostles use this. They use this in their preaching a lot. Uh, so picture this. Based on what these rabbis were teaching and believed, Jesus' day would be Jesus rising on the third day would be a very compelling thing to know and understand that Jesus's resurrection reveals him to be the Holy One of God. So this whole uh, fourth day decomposition reality does bear some meaning in our own Lord's resurrection, but that's not what we're talking about. This question mark is for Lazarus. What about Lazarus? Why is this important with Lazarus that he has already been in the tomb for four days? And here's the reason. Because it means that this Jesus has control over souls. 
He is able to bring the souls of the departed back into their bodies by simply speaking their name. This is the moment everything has been leading up to. Who is this? Who is this? An angel cannot do this. Nobody can do this. There is only one. And how can it be that that one stands here in human flesh right before us? Well, it's, his name is Jesus. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained and seated in the house. Martha is trying to save Jesus. She knows the Jews have come to comfort her, right? But they've come for another reason. They've come to see if Jesus is going to show up. And so she heads him off at the pass. She runs out and she says, wait, wait, Jesus. Um, the, the Jews are here and they're looking for you. Um, and so she goes and maybe tries to help him not just get arrested right away. But Mary, where's Mary? Mary is still in the house over here. And so this is, there, this is a beautiful picture for us, um, dear ones. We, we need to meditate on this. Why does John tell us this? Why does he tell us that Mary is waiting in the house? Because she's waiting for him. This is the posture that Jesus commended her for, sitting at his feet, in this very house, waiting and meditating on his word. She has returned there in her grief. She's meditating on what he has said and confident that he will come. He will act and she need only wait. Now, the other thing that's really beautiful about this, so we've got, we've got Romain and then we've also got uh, heard and went to meet. So see, see how all these verbs um, line up? Look at this. Um, Martha, she makes sure that when she hears the word, she runs to meet Jesus, where Mary is waiting for the word to come to her. We're both of these women at different times and in different ways, aren't we? Sometimes we run to meet him when we hear he's there. Other times, we simply wait in, in faith, wait for him. Mary and Martha give us a place to find ourselves in the midst of our grief. They show us faith in all its beautiful forms. Mar Martha, who, he who hears and runs to meet, and Mary, who waits to receive. In fact, you could, you could really say that these two sisters are, are, are one, are united. They're one unity in faith. They're the, they're the waiting and they're uh, the running to meet. Um, and that both of these, this is beautiful. It's, they're not a, opposed to each other. They're different expressions of how faith receives the word at different moments. And um, you might even say, uh, one is very heavenly, it's very, it's, it's the waiting, the, the kind of sitting and receiving. And then one is very earthly, the running and meeting. Both are beautiful. And when, when you put them together, you have a full picture of how faith works. So what happens? Well, there's going to be a little, there's going to be a little dialogue here. And we're going to see it down here. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Martha's a believer. She believes that had Jesus been there, he would have kept Lazarus alive. His prayer would have been heard by the Father. And yet, she still trusts Jesus. She still knows 
that he has direct access, even now, I still know, and I still trust you. I'm a little disappointed, but I, d I haven't changed my faith, dear Jesus. But Jesus has come here to surprise her and reveal who he is to glorify God. Take a look. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. We're talking a matter of timing here. Will rise again. Yep, he will. And Martha says, it's going to be on the last day. She believes in the resurrection of the dead. She, she knows that that will happen. And she receives the comfort that Jesus gives to her um, here. She confesses her trust. Yep. The resurrection is, is definitely where I can put my hope. But we are, we are, the surprise is coming because the timing is the question here. And then just as, this is what Jesus says. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection on the last day. And I am the life thereafter. I cause the resurrection and the life that everyone has in them. It comes from me. It came from me to each of you at your beginning. And it comes from me to you now by this very word. And yes, on the last day, it will still come from me. This is how John uh, started his gospel, if you're uh, familiar, in John chapter 1. Remember? In him, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. It's John 1. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Don't let physical death deceive you. It is no obstacle to me or to the resurrection of the body. What truly matters is whether you are living in me, believing in me, depending on me, receiving your entire life and being from me as your source. For if you are, you shall never die. Your soul is alive. And it will always be alive in me, even though your physical body goes to sleep for a time, awaiting the resurrection like an afternoon nap, you know, uh, that will come on that last day. In fact, you know that word cemetery? Do you know what that word cemetery means? It means sleeping place. From the Greek, koimaterion. A mere dormitory is the same word. You know, remember university? Oh, we're gonna, you going back to the dorm? <laughs> yeah, it's like a dead zone. No, I mean, the mere dormitory for, this is, this is all this is for the saints, for those, for those believers in Jesus. They are just having an afternoon nap and by a simple word, hey, Lazarus, he can uh, raise us from that nap. That's how simple it is for him. Now, I'm going to draw this here. Luther had this beautiful image. This is what he said about the cemetery. He said, the cemetery is no heap of the dead, but a field full of kernels known as God's kernels, which will verdantly blossom forth again and grow more beautiful than can possibly be imagined. You remember the old, uh, how the church has always had the cemetery around the church is because of this belief. It's because of this teaching, these words about exactly what Jesus says will happen. The beauty awaits. The resurrection awaits. It's going to be a brief time for the Lord, for the saint. It's like we don't experience it like sleep, but it, for the Lord, it's as simple as ra rising, raising us from sleep. And um, what a peaceful uh, image that Jesus gives us here shall never die. Just 
taking a break for a second until I rouse you. Now, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. You see him d deal with the death of body and soul, like we said at the beginning, right? The body may die, but if you believe in me, the soul is already alive. Faith, faith is the life of the soul. Trust in Jesus is life in the soul. And of course, though your body uh, goes briefly waiting for the resurrection, they will be united again. I will speak them together once more. The word did it the first time. And the word will do it again. Trust me. And then you will benefit most from that, particularly now, because you will have peace about it and can walk forward. Now, I want to make sure, where is it? I am. You never want to miss this. This is Jesus' last I am statement in the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus, uh, of course, this, I could bring this out here for us for some fun. Um, I am being the name of God in the Old Testament, Yahweh, in, well, yod Hey wow Hey, is, uh, uh, that's the, the name I am. I am who I am. God told Moses, we, we think of at the burning bush there, most of all. And, of course, that was it. But that's his name the whole way through the Old Testament. And, of course, here in our Greek, what's happening is he's not just saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He is also saying, um, ego eimi, which is to say, I, I am. Ego, you know the ego. There it is, I. And eimi means I am. So, it's like there's a comma here. He's saying, I, Yahweh, I, the I am, I, the only true God who has created all things. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, Jesus is talking about his whole person here. He's talking about the word made flesh, John 1. He's talking about the God man. Jesus is the resurrection he is the resurrection of the body because he has a body. Humanity is new in him. Humanity is without sin in his flesh. His body and blood hold the eternal life of God. And he shares, even feeds it to us, into our bodies, that we may be raised up whole. Not simply our souls. Jesus is the fulfillment of all things, soul and body heaven and earth, God and humanity, united, extra real, more real than you can handle, more real than you could ever be ready for on this side of that great resurrection. And yet look at him standing right in front of you, telling you, here I am. I am. And so you're at, left with this question. Do you believe this? Do you believe this is who I am? Do you believe these promises have power? Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This is what you came for. This confession of truth. This is what it's all about. And Martha is happy to declare it. You are the one Lord. Your life is coming into the world. You are the true light. You are the bread of life. You are the good shepherd. You are the door. And you're coming into the world to lead us out, to take us through death and resurrection to eternal life. Notice the faith. Notice this has nothing to do with what we do, but simply a matter of whether we trust. Our actions will not change his coming into the world. Jesus is asking us, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for asking us that. For without your coming, without your speaking to us, without your asking us that question, we would just remain dead. But you, in your grace and mercy, in your love, you come right in front of us. You confront us with who you are 
and you speak right into our ears, right into our hearts, in our faces. Do you believe this? And you will never stop asking us that we may benefit from the life you are putting into our dead humanity. Do it in our life every day. Crucify our old self, the old dead self that won't help anyone. And fill us with your own life. Speak that word into us anew. And grant us your spirit for our walk with you. May this be a blessing not just to us, but to all that you have put in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, God bless you. May you uh, take a look again through that. Good stuff, always good stuff. You precious kernel of the Lord above. We'll see you next time.